my name is Matthew Wilson. I'm the director of the Center for Faith and Learning here at SMU and a member of the political science department here. And uh, on behalf of SMU and the Center for Faith and Learning and the O'Neill Center, I'm pleased to welcome all of you to our symposium on faith and the free market. And we're really excited about this program. This is something that collaboratively the Center for Faith and Learning and the O'Neill Center have been working on together for some time. And it really represents a nice fusion of our two missions. Uh, that is, the uh, O'Neill Center is uh, dedicated to uh, promoting understanding of how capitalism works among the general public, policymakers, business managers, and the next generation of business leaders. And our mission in the Center for Faith and Learning is to promote integration of intellectual and spiritual life and to shed light on how faith perspectives can improve our understanding of important and interesting social policy questions. So this discussion of the relationship between faith and free markets uh, really does lie nicely at the nexus of, of the missions of our two centers. So we're delighted together uh, to be able to bring this to you. Uh, our first panel, which uh, I will be moderating, we'll get started in, in just a moment. I just want to introduce to you our speakers. Uh, we have, first of all, Steve Long, who is the McGuire Chair of Ethics here at Southern Methodist University. We have Abby McCloskey, who is the uh, founder of uh, McCloskey Policy Consultants and an economist. Uh, we have Mike Davis, who is an economist with the O'Neill Center here at SMU. And we have Christine Imba, who uh, writes for the Washington Post and is also a Robert Novak Journalism Fellow. Now, what these people, yes. So we have uh, four people who are approaching these questions from a variety of different professional and disciplinary backgrounds, uh, but all of them share in common that they are seriously interested both in questions of economic policy and in questions of spirituality and religious faith. And so they are really well positioned to talk about the intersection of these two things. The way this panel will work is that I'll invite each of our panelists uh, to offer some reflections for about 10 minutes apiece. Then uh, I'll moderate with some questions, a discussion amongst the panelists, and I'll pose questions. Some maybe collectively to the panel, others perhaps to individual speakers. We'll do that for about 30 minutes or so. And then I'll open it up to general questions from the audience, so you'll have the opportunity uh, to ask questions of, of one or more of the speakers. So uh, without further ado, why don't I turn it over to you, Steve, and okay. we'll get going. Thank you. I, I want to thank Matthew and Steve Rank and, and Ryan as well for their work here at the university and the Center for Faith and Learning. It's a, it's a great gift to all of us. I'm a theologian, which means I was popular in the 13th century, and it's been downhill since then. So I'm not an economist. I'm not the son of an economist, to sort of quote the prophet. Uh, I am a theologian. We were offered four questions for our brief remarks, and I'll begin with the last question posed. How do your religious beliefs inform your positions? The primary way that my religious beliefs inform my position about the free market is in my understanding of freedom. Now, what constitutes freedom is contested. Everybody's always for freedom, but what freedom actually is, is not easily definable. At least since Isaiah Berlin's famous 1958 lecture, Two Concepts of Liberty, freedom has been divided between what's called negative freedom, and, or negative liberty and positive liberty. Negative liberty is the dominant understanding of freedom in the modern era. I think it's what we're accustomed to. Positive liberty was, was that which negative liberty replaced. It was more prevalent in antiquity and even into the Middle Ages. Negative liberty can be more fully divided between liberal and republican freedom. Liberal freedom is non-interference. We are free insofar as our agency can affect its will in the world without unnecessary interference from others. I would suggest there are at least two poles, I mean, there are two poles of, of a negative liberal freedom. Um, you might say um, um, the libertarian and the liberal egalitarian. The, the, the libertarian would be Hayek, uh, the one, or Ayn Rand, we can even go a little further out there. Ayn Rand, uh, the libertarian, uh, the liberal egalitarianism would be John Stuart Mill, John Rawls. The difference between these two would be the extent to which <clears throat> government plays a role in regulating non-interference. Government has a role in both of them. That's why libertarians, like everybody else, want to seek 
government positions. You ever thought about that? Like people want to say, oh, we don't want any government. Oh, yeah, but we want to be in control. Uh, it's always been a kind of mystery to me. Um, so there's, 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 two, there's two poles uh, um, in this. For libertarians, government's role is primarily negative. You enforce voluntary contracts, you preserve property rights, you ensure equality of opportunity, you punish those who would violate contract and property rights. Liberal egalitarians have more of a role for government. Its purpose would include ensuring contracts and preserving property rights, but it would also include government efforts to ensure not only equality of opportunity, but conditions that would diminish inequality. So it includes something like the German co-determination model of the corporation, if you know what that is about, where uh, sometimes 40% of workers will sit on a, on a board. Um, and that, I mean, that's, that's a liberal idea. That's not socialism, not even close. But it's, it's a liberal egalitarian idea uh, in Germany called the co-determination. Or it might include Elizabeth Warren's Accountable Capitalism Act. And if, if you're interested in that, read uh, Ms. Imbus, a wonderful editorial about it in the Post. Um, so that's liberal freedom. Republican freedom is also a form of negative freedom. But rather than non-interference, it's freedom from domination. So liberal freedom focuses on non-interference. I'm free if no one's interfering, and I can affect my agency in the world within reason. Republican freedom is freedom from non-domination. I'm free in as much as neither a majority nor a minority can dominate me in my uh, agency. Republican freedom requires government involvement in policies of reconstruction to address historic wrongs, acknowledging them and seeking to repair them. Republican freedom was attempted in the United States during Reconstruction, but it's not been a dominant form of freedom in the United States. The Civil Rights Movement, Dr. King's Economic Bill of Rights, I think, could be seen as a Republican view of freedom, but in truth, I, would, I, I think, most of our economic and policies occur in the space of a negative liberal freedom between a libertarian view of freedom, which somehow got named conservatism, which in the history of that is, just ba is, is intriguing but, but, but baffling because originally um, a people of faith just thought this understanding of, of freedom was, was deeply dangerous and damaging to faith. And, so, and, and a liberal egalitarian view of freedom, which sometimes gets named as the left. Um, now, if I have to choose among these forms of negative freedom, I'd side with the Republican view, and if I was in charge of everything, the, the Fed and economics, I'd construct an economic policy based on it, and I would have no idea how to do that. But, but, but my problem with negative freedom is that it leaves little room for faith to play a role. I don't think faith has much of a role in negative freedom precisely because it's freedom from. It's freedom from and not a freedom for. In fact, I fear that the most extreme forms of liberal freedom lead to nihilism. And nihilism, as Nietzsche diagnosed it, when our, is when our highest ideals devalue themselves. God, truth, goodness no longer do any work for us. They don't matter. And I think in a post-truth world, Nietzsche is one of the most important diagnosticians we have today to explain what's going on. We might espouse belief in God. We might espouse goodness, truth, and beauty, those great transcendental predicates of being that rendered intelligible the Middle Ages and made possible the construction of cathedrals rather than Walmarts. But in the end, even if we affirm them, they don't do any work. They are like whether you buy a Chevy or a Ford, a private preference. It comes as no surprise then that Nietzsche had the madman seek God to no avail in the marketplace. That's how his account of the death of God happens. The madman goes to the marketplace and says, I seek God, I seek God. It's intentional. Why is he in the marketplace? You wouldn't, why would you seek God in the marketplace? It was in the marketplace that the madman could not find God and finally had to proclaim God is dead, and we have killed him. I find Corey Robbins convincing when he tells us that many of the leading economists, especially the Austrian school, which gave us, I think, our dominant account of value today, that many of them were leading theoreticians of Nietzsche's movement, as Hayek was. Rand was a close follower of Nietzsche, stating, 
quote, this is a quote, the secret of life is you must be nothing but will. Know what you want and do it. Just do it. Completely nihilistic. It comes as no surprise that Ludwig von Mises praised Atlas Shrugged. For Nietzsche taught that value is entirely subjective. It is nothing but preference. The world is meaningless, just neutral, raw material until our will gives it value. Anyone who has faith has to reject that proposition. Anyone who looks at the world and sees God's handiwork, sees creation, and not just raw natural resources, must reject this view of value. Moreover, for people of faith, liberty can't just be negative, it has to also be positive. I'm a Methodist, we're in a Methodist institution, so you will, I hope, concede that it's appropriate for me to quote the Methodist prayer of confession in our, Euchar our Eucharistic liturgy. In that prayer we say, after we've confessed our sins, that we seldom love God, we seldom love our neighbor, we haven't heard the cry of the needy, and on the whole we've been lousy excuses for Christians. After we say that every Sunday, which we need to say every Sunday, we then say this, free us for joyful obedience. Free us for joyful obedience. We are free, not when we have to choose among a variety of options. We are free when we are free for God. As St. Augustine noted, the will is unfree if it follows its own desires without any grace direction. Then it is in curvata se, tur cur turned in upon itself. It is free when it is directed toward the love of God and neighbor by being moved outside itself. Now, like St. Augustine, I consider myself an Augustinian Wesleyan. Like St. Augustine, I think there are two cities in which Christians must exercise their faith, the city of God and the earthly city. We have obligations in both. In our ec economic policy prescriptions in the city of God, our present life in the church should take as their norm the spirit and views virtue of charity. And here I think we need to be more intentional about how we distribute and make our money. On the one hand, we could have a common pot, and I know communities that in fact do that. They follow Acts 2 quite carefully. They don't do it, man, you know, they don't require everybody to do it, but they do it voluntarily. Uh, and they have a, a, some amazing acts that they can do. On the other hand, I think the church should have at least a maximum moral income. If you can't live on, if you can't live on let's say, $250,000 for a family of four. Anything more than that should be like, like, like watching porn on the bus. Or, you know, like, like something just really immoral. We, we, we have to recover this idea that, that you know, that, that you can't just, I mean, for St. Augustine, all of our luxuries, he, he said this, all of our luxuries steal from the poor. And that's, that's an account of citizenship that we should have. And I think one of the things we should do whenever anybody joins the church, we should, that we should require of them, how much money do you make and how much are you giving away? So that would be the, the citizenship within the life of the church. Okay, it's a voluntary community. You don't, it, it's, not, uh, you know, it's not the brown boots kicking down the door and, and, and claiming your house for the revolution. Uh, and if you read Mr. Wesley, John Wesley, that's what the early Methodists actually did. They actually did that. They required that of one another in their discipleship. So that's our citizenship in the... In the, city of, in the city of God, we could talk a lot more about that, but then there's also our citizenship in the earthly city. It, too, is God's good creation in what we call the saculum, the time between the time. That's where the word secular comes from. There's an appropriate secular reality that economists help us understand, and we have to figure out, that, you know, not all earthly cities are the same. Some are better than others. So how do we figure out what kind of earthly city that we want to have? And here I would suggest following the work of Alistair McIntyre, who has an interesting um, a, a connection between, uh, or a combination between Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, and Karl Marx, that there are basic goods for human flourishing. There are basic goods for human flourishing, which could be a natural good towards which economics should order our lives. Basic health care, education, stable families, the ability uh, to have some leisure time. 
I mean, Keynes told us we'd only be working 15 hours a week at this point. Uh, that, that didn't actually happen. You know, so, so all, all of these things, there, there are natural good. Before we talk about economics, we have to talk about what is, it, what is the good? What does it mean to flourish as a human being? And once we've done that, then the question is, how do you construct a society that does that? I, and, and I'll conclude with this, I think neoliberalism since the 1980s clearly has not accomplished that. The stagnation of wages among uh, the, the bottom 50%, the gross inequities in, in income, which now rival that of the ancient regime, and the ability for this to continue to feed itself simply has not been able us to achieve that human flourishing, which means we have to, and, and this is the wonderful thing about being an Augustinian Christian, I have no stake in a single notion of an earthly city. So I'm very intrigued right now, say, by something like Matthew Brunig's work in what he calls nickel and dime socialism. And uh, I've already gone over my time, so um, maybe I could try to explain that a bit more uh, in uh, the later conversation. So thank you. Thank you. I, too, want to start by thanking Matthew and the O'Neill Center for pulling together this conference. And it's particularly refreshing in light of our current tribal and partisan environment to go back to the basics of faith and how do people flourish and are there ways that we can be doing better. And so in the brief time I have, I'll talk about three different areas. The first is my own faith foundation, how it impacts my view of economic policy. The second is our current economic reality, which Steve began to touch on and which I'll uh, talk about a bit more. And the third is a set of policies that I'm thinking about as a person of faith, as an economist, um, given our current realities for moving forward. And so to begin, I'm an Anglican, and there are wonderful things about being an Anglican, but one of the most wonderful things is that no one knows what it is. So it's a total <laughs> embrace of Christian mystery, and the closest thing to a good definition is that it's the intersection of being Catholic and evangelical and charismatic all wrapped up as a, a born-again Christian. So there's that, and I grew up Baptist, so that should make you feel more comfortable. Um, but for undergrad, I went to an evangelical school called Wheaton College. I was in the econ department, so we had a lot of these types of conversations about faith and economics and policy, a lot about God's heart for the poor and the oppressed and our call to be Jesus' hands and feet in the world, a lot about the concept of vocation and calling, and of course the Protestant work ethic was strong there, not just for exams, but in, in, in topics we talked about. And this afternoon, I want, to, I want to discuss something slightly different and slightly new. And to do that, I want to go back to the beginning, to the very beginning from a Christian perspective, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, which says that God created man and woman. In the image of God, he created them. And in Christianity, this means that each person has dignity and value and worth at the deepest and the most immortal levels. Um, but there's more, because we're created in the image of God, and the very first thing we read about God is that he creates. And so this concept of imago dei has to include our ability to create and to engage in the world, that it's divinely inspired, it's intentional. There's something about our ability to flourish and be people that involves our ability to create and to engage. And this has a lot to say as a principle about economic policy and tracks with some of the more recent uh, thinking about human flourishing. The Nobel Prize winner in economics, Edmund Phelps, at, back in 2006, recently released a book called Mass Flourishing, where he looks at this question, what does it mean for a person to have a good life? What does it mean for society to flourish? He defines flourishing as an experience with the new. To me, this harkens back to the Imago Dei to create. And that mass flourishing, when a society is, is flourishing you know, broadly, that that's because as many people are included in the process of innovation and engagement as possible. And this seems maybe quite basic to us that we talk about in economics as economic opportunity. What's your ability to participate in the system? But as a, as a public policy guidepost, this is relatively new. It wasn't until the 18th and 19th century that we began seeing um, economies, governments set up on the belief that each individual has value and they have, we're better off when as many people are as engaged as possible. It's not until the 18th and 19th century where we see capitalism and democracy and some of the great uh, um, economic freedom thinkers like Adam Smith talking about these ideas not as a means to themselves or means 
you know, to their own end, but as a means to open up widespread engagement. And of course, nowhere epitomizes this more, despite her flaws, than America, the land of opportunity, the American dream, where people would come and create and engage in a way separate from where they were born or how they looked that was different and unique and more powerful than before. Um, but no country is perfect and no system of government is perfect. And that brings us to the second part of what I want to talk about, which is our economic reality. And so, you know, we hear a lot about how well the economy is doing. We've come out of the Great Recession. We're the first economy in the world to surpass $21 trillion. We have low unemployment. Just last week, the U.S. regained its place as the most competitive country in the whole wide world from the World Economic Forum. You know, by a lot of measures, things are going really well. And yet certain people and communities are finding themselves left behind. And it has become increasingly obvious that there's been some drift from America, the land of opportunity, the American dream, than, than how we've thought about it maybe in the past. And sure enough, um, you know, Dr. Phelps stops the clock around 1960. The literature on economic opportunity shows some sort of inflection to point around 1980. But things have changed. And when you look at our economic reality today, we have a historic share of Americans who are no longer working. Among middle-aged men, the work rates are what they were back in the Great Depression in those first few years coming out of it. We have one of the lowest work rates in the whole OECD. Um, when you look at families and communities, there's a fraying, there's a breaking apart, which is keeping people in intergenerational poverty, the absolute antithesis of the promise of the land of opportunity. 70% of kids born poor never get out. And by the way, that's irrespective of what the top tax rates are, the regulatory environment, or the broader economic environment around, around us. And, and lastly, uh, you know, we're seeing this rise in deaths of despair among middle-aged whites. For the first time in modern history, people are dying younger, and it's primarily because of drug overdoses and suicides and depression. Again, a, a disengagement, a pulling back, a lack of a belief that I have anything to offer, anybody wants me to participate anymore. And so if we go back to what I said in the beginning and hold to this belief that people are created in God's image, they have dignity and value on their own, and we do believe that everyone has something to contribute and we're better off when as many people are contributing as possible, well then something is wrong with where we're currently at. Something is deeply wrong. And that brings us to the third point of, well, what do we do? And, uh, you know, the spoiler alert is that neither political party has all the answers. It's the Anglican mushy middle <laughs> for you. Um, you know, I do think historically it's, it's very clear that economic freedom has laid the groundwork for as many people to be as involved as possible, and the right has consistently advocated for more regulatory and fiscal restraint. It's necessary, I'd argue, based on what we see right now, it's not sufficient, we're the number one country in the world for economic freedom. We still have these broader structural issues. And the left is focused on, on the poor and government programs, and there's been a dramatic ability to reduce poverty and boost consumption. And yet, despite spending $1 trillion a year on anti-poverty programs, the needle on economic opportunity, on engagement, has remained relatively unchanged. And so what I'm thinking about as we move forward is how do we have a dynamic and growing economy that let, lets as many people contribute and engage as possible in a meaningful way. Uh, one of the clear ways to do this is first by encouraging work. I mean, work is a main problem from a macroeconomic perspective, but also from a dignity perspective. We subsidize a lot of things as the United States of America. I think there's very few things we could subsidize that's more important than work itself. And yet work is, you know, any type of wage subsidy, which we do have in place, it's called the Earned Income Tax Credit, is much smaller than the types of subsidies we offer for health care or state and local tax deductions or mortgages. It's, it's prioritized relatively low. I think that should be changed, that we should consider a dramatic expansion of a wage subsidy, which has been found to induce workforce participation quite effectively. And said old Economics 101 adage, that if you tax something, you get less of it. If you subsidize something, you get more of it. We should be encouraging work. Not because of my Protestant work ethic, by the way, but because that is where people mostly create and engage with the world around them. That is where most people spend most of their day. And I think that same spirit of creation and engagement should continue into, as you touched on, Stephen, to the charitable sector, that individuals and communities and churches and synagogues can, can give more creatively to the people around them because they're right there, they're local, as opposed to a distant bureaucracy and a broad program. And yet our current system essentially says we only care if 
half of the population gives charitably. Only half of the population gets a tax write-off if you give. The other half, you know, your contributions just might not be as valuable or less encouraged. And that has to lead to the belief that there's just less agency to make other people's life better. I think we should reconsider that, that there should be an incentive across the board for everybody to be able to give and help someone close to them and someone in need. And lastly, when we talk about Imago Dei and everyone, everyone being created in God's image, it's one thing to set the broad framework with economic freedom and to encourage work as much as possible and to encourage you know, us taking care of each other, which should just happen out of our own you know, well-being, but fine, let's encourage it more with public policy. But the last is we have to acknowledge the structural barriers that are in place for broad creation and flourishing. That we have 20 million men with criminal convictions who have a lot of trouble getting jobs. That we have 1.6 million Americans who've been unemployed for over six months and whose job skills have atrophied. They're not a great hire, they need help. What do we do about the nine million people on permanent disability insurance who because of the structure of that program are essentially prohibited from working, even if they could? What about the millions of moms in particular who are forced to make a false dichotomy between work and having a family because our labor laws haven't been updated since family structures have dramatically changed? What about the 11 million unauthorized immigrants who operate in a shadow economy? That if we go there into the space of saying we're better off when as many people as possible are included, not only out of a theological belief, but history bears that out, then we need to start addressing these in a more creative way. And so to conclude, how does my faith impact my views on economic policy quite a bit. It doesn't say that there's any particular person or political party or style of government that's perfect. In fact, it says quite the opposite, that they're all fallen, which is remarkably freeing and wonderful. Um, but it does suggest a, a set of values. And the one I talked about today and that I've been thinking about more is the concept of Imago Dei, about our worth and dignity as individuals, what that means from our political rancor and discourse all the way down to what it means for economics and how do we let people contribute and create and participate more than the current status quo. And so I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. My turn. Okay, so I, I guess I'm, I'm here as a representative of the dismal science. And so I'm gonna start off by being really dismal by mentioning that this may just be a gigantic waste of time. We may be doing no good here at all this afternoon. And I say that seriously because if you think about what economics teaches you, it teaches you that specialization matters, right? This is Adam Smith's message. Butcher should butcher, bakers should bake, and brewers should brew. And if they want a sandwich and a beer, they can trade. But trading isn't gonna make them better at understanding what they are trying to understand. Uh, it may make their lives better, but it's not gonna make them better butchers or bakers or brewers. And so I'm, what I'm wondering is if maybe this is also true in the production of ideas. Maybe what we should be doing is just specializing in what we do. I should think about economics and free markets and Steve should think about faith. And you know, if we wanna go talk to each other, that's fine, but I'm not gonna make him a better theologian and maybe he's not gonna make me a better economist. Um, but I don't think that's true. I think that this dialogue that we're having today is actually really important. I think talking to each other will make us both better off. And here's why I think this. I think that because what we're doing in economics when we think about markets and what he's doing in theology when he thinks about the things he thinks about is essentially we're answering this or looking at the same kinds of questions. What is the essential characteristic of human nature? And what are the conditions that are necessary for human flourishing? Now, we may be asking those questions for slightly different reasons, but we're asking the same question. And if I listen to Steve and Steve listens to me, I think we can both come up with better answers. So let me just drill down for a minute and explain what I mean. Uh, so economics is, we claim to be a social science, but societies are just groups of people. To really effectively do economics, I have to know what these people are all about. And if you think about sort of the, the, the faith traditions, um, I mean, uh, Abby used that word imago dei, which I've never known how to pronounce. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real Catholic, and I should know that. Um, but uh, but that, that phrase, made in the image of God, I think that appears at least three times in Genesis. And so, you know, and people argue about what that means. I Googled that Latin phrase and you get like four million hits. 
because no one really understands it. But what it must mean is that God is really connected to us as human beings. God is not some aloof creature, right? It's, it's God cares about us as people. It, and it's not, I don't mean that God cares about who wins the lottery and who's going to be condemned to being a fan of the Chicago Cubs, but God really cares about us. So what that means is if we want to understand faith, if we want to understand God, we have to understand human beings. And that's, that's so that seems to me non-controversial. And frankly, I don't quite understand why we don't have more dialogue between the people who do what I do, economics and think about markets and all that, and people like Steve and everyone else here as well. Um, now, I would like to blame him, okay? I'd like to blame the, uh, uh, the faith community, religious leaders, for their failure to understand economics. And I could make that argument, I suppose. But instead, I want to take a minute and think about why it is that we don't communicate very well. What are the obstacles that prevent this dialogue from taking place? So um, let, me, uh, let me start by telling you what I think is the obstacle which is preventing parts of the faith community from really effectively understanding economics. And um, uh, the best way I can explain this, I'll, I'll tell you a um, uh, in fact, I'm going to give this lecture this evening in a macroeconomics class. I talk about long-run economic growth, and I've got this slide that I show. And on the slide, there's two pictures. And the pictures are about the same. They're drawings. And they show peasants from a long time ago plowing fields with, a, with an oxen. And what I tell my students is that those two pictures represent the same thing, but they were they're dated 1,000 years apart it's from like 100 CE and the other one's from 1100 CE. And the reason that picture is important is that picture shows you that for most of human history, nothing ever changed, right? If you were a Christian in 32 CE or a Christian in 1492, you used the same tools, you ate the same kind of food, you, you died of the same diseases. There was never any such thing as economic progress. And then somehow beginning right around 1600, things began to get better. And it didn't happen quickly for like, took 300 years for the income of England to double from 1500 to 1800. But then for the next 100 years, it doubled again. And then the really remarkable thing is in our lifetimes. Uh, so the per capita income of people in the Great Britain has, has quadrupled between 1950 and now. Even more importantly, there's been this whole, it's spread all over the world. Right? There's like 500 million people that, according to the World Bank, have been lifted out of what they call extreme poverty, this, these are people in China, uh, into not a lifestyle that we would recognize as middle class, but a much, much better lifestyle. That's a remarkable achievement. And to be blunt, the religious community just doesn't seem to get this. Um, so let me, let, me, let me just quote this infamous quote from... Uh, uh, Pope Francis in 2013 when he wrote in this uh, apostolic exhortation, uh, Gaudium, um, Evangelii Gaudium. Uh, so here's the quote. He says, some people continue to defend trickle-down theories which assume that economic growth encouraged by a free market will inevitably succeed in bringing about greater justice and greater inclusiveness. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, expresses a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wield, wielding economic power. Um, so just think about that quote. Right? Just think about, first of all, forget the, the, the rhetoric, this trickle-down economics. That's not, a, that's not a real term that economists or anyone else uses. That's, that's a cable TV term. But never mind. Um, just think about what he's saying. That, uh, what's, where's my quote? Uh, all those people, ex that there's never been uh, no evidence. This never been confirmed by the facts. And uh, uh, the excluded are still waiting. Well, there's 500 million people in China that are no longer excluded. Their lives aren't great. There's still justice, injustice and poverty in the world. But in fact, we actually know how to lift people out of poverty. And how we lift people out of poverty is to embed them in an economy that can grow. And the way we embed them in an economy that can grow is to give them freedom. Now, why don't sort of the religious leaders get that? 
Um, I think the problem is quite straightforward. I think the problem is that religious institutions, um, they evolved at a time when there was no growth. So, you know, until 1600, everybody thought about economics the same way. Everybody thought that if you want to make poor people better off, you got to take money from rich people. And again, that's no longer true. What we know now is that if you want to make poor people better off, you embed them in a growing economy, and you embed them in a growing economy by giving them economic freedom. Um, so that's kind of my complaint about religious leaders. Now, I'm glad Pope Francis isn't here. Uh, actually, it'd be kind of cool if he was here, but if he was, he, yeah, I think. But, okay, but here's the deal. If he were here, he'd slap me into my place in no time. And I think what he would do before he put me in my place is that he'd pick up his Bible and he'd read from, uh, I think it's Matthew. I wrote it down somewhere. I'm not good about remembering Bible quotes. But the part in Matthew where he says, um, it's the bit about why do you question the um, speck in your brother's eye without seeing the beam and don't look at the beam in your own eye. So I think, in fact, in my world, the world of economics, our sins are much bigger. Our omissions, the things that we forget about, are the things that are, are, are much more significant than the fact that the pope doesn't seem to understand some World Bank statistics. Um, I'm going to run out of time before I run out of things to preach about here. But the problem, I think, with my world and what I think I can get by really applying or looking at religious traditions and thinking about what they mean for me um, is that we really need to restore the humanity to economics. Um, economics has been, for a long, long time, we've been enamored with our science. Um, you know, I grew up in a generation where we were told that we should view people as rational, maximizing agents, and we built these really cool models uh, of which explain behavior. Uh, sort of a younger generation of economics, my colleague Ryan over here, they're really data-driven, right? They think that we can understand economics by understanding facts and figures and statistics. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But what we have lost in economics is our understanding of humanity. Um, and I will tell you in closing that there, there's two books that you will never read if you got a PhD in economics. And one is Keynes' General Theory. Um, and the other is the Bible. And I'm, gonna, I, I'm not trying to make a joke. I think there's a reason why we don't read those two books in graduate school. Uh, there probably are some things in Keynes' book that are not consistent with the economics that we call Keynesianism, and that's, that's not important now. But what's important is that there's stuff in the Bible about who people really are and what people really want. And if we're going to do our social science properly, if we're going to be good economists, we have to understand the humanity of the people, and you understand the humanity of the people we're trying to, uh, to, to to help and explain and analyze, you understand them by treating them as people. Okay. So. Christine. Great. Well, um, I have to say, first of all, yes, thank you for having us here. I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion. Um, and I should also point out that I hate going at the end uh, because all the good ideas have been taken. Um, but happily, because of our different specializations, I think that we can still bring uh, new and interesting things to the table. At least, I hope I can. So forgive me if I do not. Um, but I will also state that I'm a journalist. Uh, as you said, I'm an opinion writer for the Washington Post. Um, I'm not an economist. And so I think that I tend to come to uh, my policy recommendations and preferences um, from a more humanistic perspective rather than by modeling or even necessarily by theory. That said, I do think that all humans are like this to some extent. I think that we're all endowed with a sense of reason uh, and a conscience that can be well or poorly trained. But at the basis of that, I think that we can all sort of tell uh, when things aren't fair, when things are wrong, 
And we can often sense when things are not conducive to a good life, or at least the life that we would hope to lead. So I stated that I work at the Washington Post, and I hope that my editors do not hear that I'm quoting from our sibling paper, the New York Times. <laughs> um, but the Times last weekend had an engrossing and also horrifying story about pregnancy discrimination um, and incidences of miscarriage uh, in factory workers. So there are these women who have shift work um, in different factories and distribution centers across the United States. Um, their work usually involves lifting heavy boxes, uh, monitoring work lines, etc. And of course, because they're women, sometimes they're pregnant. Um, most of these women want their children. They're excited to be pregnant. They go to their doctors. They get doctor's notes that say, you know, please let this person avoid heavy lifting. This person uh, has a high risk pregnancy, allow her to take breaks. And what this study revealed was that many employers completely ignore those doctor's notes. Uh, it is more important for them that the factory line, factory line goes as quickly as possible um, than that these women can carry to term. And so many of these women miscarry. And there was one quote that stood out to me um, from this article that I found quite haunting. Uh, one woman alleged that her supervisor told her to get an abortion because she needed to keep working. And if she wanted her job, she had to keep working. And she did not get an abortion. She kept working. And she miscarried on the distribution warehouse floor. And in the lawsuit that she filed, she stated, I lost my baby for this job. Why didn't you help me? I think any human with reason realizes that that's unacceptable. That's disgusting. The economy should work for humans, not the other way around. Human flourishing should be the end goal of our economic system. So for me, much of my understanding of the idea of human flourishing, and also my understanding and belief in this idea of conscience and dignity, um, has its basis in my faith. So I'm Catholic, uh, in fact a convert, I converted in college. And one of the things that attracted me to the church was its very clear and sort of logical expression of what human flourishing could look like and what the paths to it could look like in everyday life. And one of those teachings that I found specifically interesting and compelling was Catholic social teaching. It's a tradition and a sort of set of doctrines uh, on matters of human dignity and common good in society. And it's broad, although there are some sort of underlying themes that touch every part of it. It has a huge amount to say on economics, because if you think about it, economics are one of the ways that we express our faith in our life. We go to work, we speak to and engage with our neighbors, we encounter temptations and sometimes resist them. Uh, as Abby said, we fulfill our creative potential. Um, we can create things and express our talents. We're makers in the image of God. But Catholic social teaching has some, I think, limits on what we can trust to the economy, what we can trust to theory, and what we should use to guide our decision making. So there are four of them that I think are very useful and that I keep in mind when trying to evaluate policy decisions or thinking about policies that might be put into place. One is that the needs of the poor take precedence over the desires of the rich. Another is that the rights of workers are more important than the maximization of profit. Another is that the preservation of the environment should be more important than uncontrolled industrial expansion. And another is that production for social needs is more important than production for the military. And I think these are things that, again, if we think about them um, as humans with reason, with an understanding of what we want a good life to be, they make sense. The question is whether we can follow them and whether we can convince others to. But every economic decision I try to make, and I think that our society tries to make, um, both 
in the state and also in individual companies and our individual investments should be judged in light of whether it protects and preserves or whether it undermines this human dignity and human flourishing that should be our end goal. So one of our questions uh, for our prepared remarks were, what are some economic policies that might actually do that? Um, I tend to think and write about big ideas, policies that have been put in place or haven't been put in place are just like things that I like and think are kind of exciting. Um, that is one of the main benefits of my work, actually. Um, so I can start, I think, from a very macro level and just give three examples um, that I think are probably worth discussing and perhaps we'll get to them on this panel. So at the state level, the 2008 financial crisis uh, really gave us a close look at what we choose to subsidize and what effect it has on everyday people. How much should we invest in our financial markets? How much should we trust to regulation? How much leeway should we give creditors? Um, and how much should we allow companies to bet against individuals? That's a question of discernment, but it's one that we need to answer. On a sort of more personal level, the family level, maternity and paternity leave, childcare, welfare, some might say that the economy cannot sustain some of these policies, uh, that the markets have told us uh, what companies can handle. But again, the markets aren't human. We are. And if we want a society that allows for families, that allows for community, that allows for solidarity, we'll have to put some of these policies in place. And then there are even small decisions. And this is one that I've been toying about with in my thoughts for a while, the idea of blue laws, um, the laws that say you know, that you can't sell alcohol on a Sunday or that businesses should be closed on Sundays. And one of the interesting things I've noticed, I lived in Europe um, for a few short stints, is that those laws are actually far more popular in you know, a secularized Western Europe than they are in the United States. And I found this incredibly confusing actually when I first uh, lived in Switzerland. I would go out on a Sunday because I wanted to buy candy, because I ate a lot of candy, uh, and everything would be closed. It was incredibly confusing. And I asked a Swiss friend why this was so, and he said, well, you're supposed to spend time with your family? And so that was something I should know? A family, what? But the markets, but the stores, but I need to buy things, but I need to participate. I don't, really. And making the decision to institute policies like that, or not to, gives us some indication of what we value as a society and what we think is most important for human flourishing. But yes, as I said, the most common pushback to some of these more expansive or even theoretical policies is that the economy can't handle it, or that you know we have a free market, we have the invisible hand that sort of shows us what people desire. But I think one thing that we need to remember is that free markets are not people. They're a theory. The invisible hand is not like a real hand. It's not someone's hand. Um, this is an economic idea. And we can decide which ideas we support, how we discuss them, uh, and how we push them forward or not. The economy is created by humans. And so it can be changed by humans too. And it's our responsibility to find ways to allow the most humans to flourish through our prudential judgments, but through our understanding of what really matters. And I think that's actually the question that should be at the heart of these discussions. All right, thank you very much. So as I anticipated from this panel, uh, we have some very disparate takes on things. Uh, disparate ideologically, dif disparate methodologically, uh, which is great. It gives us some uh, tremendous uh, areas to go into uh, in terms of discussion. What I think I'll do is uh, frame a, a question or two for each of our panelists and um, you know the, they can answer and someone else wants to chime in to add something to that, that's fine. But I'm not going to take all the time. I'm going to make sure that we have um, a bit of time at the end for uh, questions from the audience as well. And I'll begin 
with Steve. Um, and, and the two questions I have are kind of linked, so, so I'll pose them together. And I wonder if when we talk about liberal negative freedom, okay, of which you're fairly skeptical, right, the idea of liberal negative freedom, um, could that not simply entail a thinning of the public sector, a thinning of the state that then allows civil society to flourish, right? Intermediary institutions, churches, neighborhoods, <clears throat> communities, so that liberal freedom could constrain the state so that these healthy organs of civil society have greater sphere to operate. And in somewhat related to that, uh, when you talk about the Methodist prayer and its invocation of joyful obedience, is that joyful obedience to whom? Hmm. Presumably to God, right? But not joyful obedience to the state oh, no, necessarily, no. right? So, so how do you see then in, in your view this relationship between how much sphere we give the state and what we in turn do to the agency in civil society? Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, I am critical of liberal negative freedom, but it's always better than fascism. So if your options are liberal negative freedom, or fascism, choose liberal negative freedom. So, you know, I don't want, to, I don't want us to set up uh, inappropriate binaries. Um, it's like, if, if your options are capitalism or, or feudalism, choose capitalism. I mean, I, it's not like uh, many of us haven't recognized the efficiency of the capitalist markets and the wealth they've produced. We just want to say the fact that they have pr produced this wealth means we can rethink how we, how, the next step. Um, um, and, and we don't have to have some of those in, inequities. Uh, is it the thinning of the state which allows for civil society? Or, or I, I, I've done quite a bit of work lately on, on civil society. Uh, the one thing I would say is I would never place the church as a voluntary institution in civil society. The church is a transnational reality, which is, which, which is not in any sense beholden to the state. I think civil society often is still bounded by the state. The state still, I mean, look at the state right now. It still, in some sense, even chooses, it, it makes the conditions for certain uh, uh, economic uh, arrangements without, without always explicitly uh, stating so. Um, ha Jun Chang's es, uh, essay, if you've read this little book, popular book, 24 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism, where he goes through and shows where, in fact, it has been certain state regulations in China and other places which have allowed for the, the kind of flourishing, I think, is a very useful understanding of how, how the state and the civil society are still connected. Joyful obedience is to Jesus, not to the state. And um, that's why I'm an Augustinian. I think there are two citizenships people of faith must always take into account. And my fear, I mean, I, like, I'm, I'm quite serious that as a theologian, I was popular in the 13th century, but now it's very controversial. It's hard for us to, I mean, we don't have a school like this. Um, um, and that's partly because of the success of, of you economists and business people. Now, I blame Javons, not Stanley Javons, for the reason we don't talk. Right, because Stanley Javons is the economist who said, forget political economy. Every, everything was political economy up to that time. And then Javon says, no, no, it's a mathematical science. So he, so in, I mean, this is, so he, he, he got rid of the political so that there's, there's not this assumption that economics is a moral science. I really love that idea. I think it is. Keynes said that economics is a moral system. Hume, Smith, Mill, they were all moral philosophers. And what we've done is we've, we've, we've bracketed out that component. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know, but in theology, you have to read the history of your discipline to understand it. Do economists read the history of their discipline? Uh, not much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've not met many who did. Um, I mean, but I do think the conversation is really important. So, so in that sense, one of, one of my concerns about, the, about these two cities is not that I want to give allegiance to the state. No, not at all. Uh, but I do fear that commercial society, because that's what Hume and Smith said is the most important. That's why they were skeptical of the church. Commercial society has replaced almost everything as that which renders us intelligible. Not everything, because it couldn't do it, right? We still don't make decisions about our children based on uh, uh, ra being rational maximizers. I mean, my goodness, I had a, a, one child who's a theologian and one child who's an English major in college, and I subsidized their education. That wasn't rational. So I mean, I mean so there are many things about our lives that, that, that are, are free from, from commercial society. And commercial society has a place, but my fear is it wants it all. 
Abby, um, you talked about the role of work in human flourishing, and in fact that one of the challenges to human flourishing is the number of people who are in fact excluded from meaningful work for various reasons, uh, economic structures, disability, you know, problems in the labor market, whatever it may be. Um, and that raised for me at least an, what I think is an interesting question, um, which is many futurists today anticipate a world without work or a world with less work through technology, robotics, et cetera, that we'll be able to produce all of the goods that we need with much less human effort. Okay. Now, I mean, this is not a science panel. We're not going to get into the technical details of how true that is, whether that's true. But let's, let's stipulate for a moment that there's some truth to that. Um, would that diminution of work and toil through technology would that be a moral blessing or a curse in the economy? Would that contribute to human flourishing in, in your conception of the economy? Or does that freedom, that liberation from work, actually create greater moral problems with purposelessness? That is, would, would you see that as a looming blessing or a looming curse? Yeah, this is a big question worthy of its own panel. Sure. <laughs> and obviously, no one knows what's going to happen with the future of automation. I think that most rational estimates are not that all jobs go away, but that the nature of work changes, that there's particularly really high-skilled work or really low-skilled work, and we don't either have the skill makeup to do the high-skilled work or people no longer want to do the low-skilled work jobs because of the size of government benefits or wages just go so low it's not worth it. And so, again, I think when we think about public policy and setting the stage for the future, it's why I'm very supportive and have written extensively about a wage subsidy to encourage work no matter what that type of work is to keep people engaged because I do think it's important not because work is futile and like the soil will work against you and all the other things you read about in Genesis, but because it's also the space where people create and engage and interact. And you know where this conversation I think is going more politically is that coming up for the next presidential election and beyond, there's a lot of discussions about things like universal uh, basic income, about guaranteed government jobs, about minimum wages, about ways to either help people not to work or to divert them into 100% government jobs where there is automatically going to be less creativity because you're not responding to a, a market need, you're responding to a, a government created program. And I think that those types of ideas do very much concern me. And in fact, those ideas concern me more than whatever happens in the automation space if that is a way to dodge and both answer your question at the same time. Well, I, l let me point out also I'm being just hideously unfair here because I'm throwing out these questions that could be answered in a book-length manuscript and saying, you have two minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, so so uh, it, thank you for, for addressing it to the extent that you can. Do you want to weigh in on that, Christine? Yeah, I did actually because universal basic income is one of my interests these days. I just I think it's fascinating for all the reasons you describe. Um, and I am of two minds about it, actually. I do think that it's possible that the diminution of work would allow for more human freedom uh, and space for us to pursue our real talents and our real interests, that sort of thing. Um, but in terms of what humans are really like, there is that sort of need to train ourselves. We have to learn how to be leisurely in the right way. Uh, we have to you know, learn how to best use our time. And I think one of the problems going forward with that idea, and one of the reasons why this would be a problem, is that that's something that we've kind of left behind. Uh, we've really fallen behind on you know, training the life of the mind and understanding you know, what actually causes us to flourish. So when you're looking at um, long-term unemployment today, especially actually among young men, uh, there's been an interest, like a huge growth in just gaming like, you, you know, you stay at home and you don't do anything. Like, you're not, like, painting or writing poetry. You're just playing video games, which is not necessarily a healthy use of time. So how do we train people to use that time? Like, what would it look like to create an educational system that would prepare people to fill those hours in the day with something useful that was conducive to their flourishing? I don't know, but I think that's something that we need to be thinking about. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Sir, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to oh, cut you no. off. So I just wanted to make the comment. I, I think we all should share the concern that uh, is, are people going to be able to find meaning in their lives as technology progresses and work changes? But I think that we should also remember that challenge is not being presented because of capitalism. The fact that 
we don't need as many manufacturing workers nowadays as we needed 40 years ago is, is, is not a flaw in the capitalist system, but it may be a flaw in, in other institutions. Uh, I'm, it, so you, you now know you have three Catholics on the panel up front here. Matt is also a Catholic, and uh, you know, you, I don't want to dredge up bad memories, but you know the, the horrors that we're going through right now in our church with all the various scandals. And it's really weakening the ability of our particular faith community to give meaning to people's lives because, you know, frankly, our clergy have failed us. Uh, and again, I don't, that's a different topic. But my point here is that we need to look beyond the flaws in capitalism. We need to look at the, at the flaws in civil society, whether it's in our religious institutions, the failure of marriage as an institution, and on and on and on. Can I say something? Go ahead, yeah. And I, I think one of the things that, 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 that's wrong about the contemporary uh, understanding of dignity is that we associate it with work. I very much liked your idea that dignity is found in the Imago Dei. I don't know when it became fashionable to think that your, your work gives you dignity. And if that's the case, then a lot of people do labor, which is just mind-numbing. And, and uh, uh, labor in scripture is a curse. It's a curse in Genesis. And I think the curses have been undone in, in, uh, in, in Christ. So I hope, I hope that you're right about in the, in the future we won't need more workers so people can do things like, hopefully not game, but write operas and produce bad poetry and, and, uh, you know, and have philosophical conversations and ride bicycles and, and just have a much more flourishing way of, of life rather than uh, uh, some of the, you know, cutting up chicken for the rest of us eight hours a day. Uh, uh, six days a week. Can I just make one quick theological point, though? Because before the fall in, this is Wheaton College for you, that whatever, however much my parents spent for that, <laughs> but um, uh, right, before the fall, we were made in God's image to create. Before the fall, there was work. The fall was that work became toil and hard and often endless. Um, but that there is still dignity in work, and I think, I think that needs to be recognized in policy as well. Yeah, it seems more a question of, of what we define as work and the kinds of work we're doing, right? Because writing operas is work, uh, right? So compose, for some composers do that, and that's their job. But, but I, I certainly take your point, Steve, that it could be a blessing to have people with much more range of control over the kind of work in which they find fulfillment right. and meaning. That, that could well be... Uh, moral progress. But uh, Mike, I want to ask you a question um, with regard to this relationship over time between uh, free market economics and kind of growth and civilizational progress that you talked about. Um, do we basically just need to accept increasing inequality as a necessary byproduct of this kind of growth that's promoted by free market economics. That is, I suppose, and this is framed kind of provocatively, but as long as basically all boats are rising, if to different degrees, do we just need to stop worrying so much about inequality so long as the civilization collectively is progressing? No, I think inequality is a big deal, but we need to think about it more carefully and in the right way. Um, I hope Russ doesn't mind. I'm going to commend a piece that he has just, was it just out a couple of days ago on medium.com on uh, income inequality and progress in income. And the point of that piece, which again is, it's easy to read and it's really, it's great, uh, is that we need to think about income inequality in a more complex manner. We need to think about income inequality or changes in income over time? Is there an opportunity for someone who is born in the lowest income quintile to rise? Um, we also need to understand, just get back to my theme, growth is so important. Uh, we can make the next generation's lives better. And that's, we have that ability now, and we didn't used to. Okay. And, uh all right, so I'll frame one for Christine, and then we'll open it up more generally for questions. So I actually have two questions for Christine. And, and first of all, so I'm really struck by the story that you uh, talked about with regard to the miscarriages and, and the, the terrible and kind of heartbreaking account there of what was happening in that. Sorry, that was kind of grim. <laughs> no, but it's, I mean, but it, but it frames some of the really hard questions that we have to wrestle with here. Um, 
but what I would ask you is, is how do we balance a deeply disturbing situation in which there are unequal miscarriage rates that are produced by an inequality within market economics versus the kind of take a step back macro picture that miscarriage rates for everyone across the society are dramatically lower than they were a century ago because one could argue of the technological and economic progress fostered by capitalist economics. I mean, that seems to me a tricky and tough question to wrestle with. Is that both of the questions? No, no I'll, I'll, I can give you the other one too. <laughs> I, the, the, sure. Uh, so the other, my other question is, uh, you, ta you said that the invisible hand idea in capitalism is just a theory, right? Uh, and that it, it's not an, a real physical thing. And to, because it's a theory, we could theorize otherwise. We're not bound by it. Um, but what if it's not so much just a theory, what if it's a force like gravity? <laughs> that is, it's something that's there whether we acknowledge it or not. And if we choose to fight against it, it's incredibly inefficient and we're going to continually be frustrated. Whereas if we accept it and work with it, it can exponentially power what we're trying to do. Those are both really interesting questions, actually, and also things that could be sort of book-length discussions. Yeah, I, I told you I was going to um, keep, keep <laughs> throwing these things out there. Hmm. Well, I think I'll start with the second one first. Um, and my immediate answer to that one, my first thought was that we fight against gravity all the time, <laughs> constantly. <laughs> Uh, we have chosen to do that just by walking around. That's like a thing that we do. Um, and by like going into space. There are many things that sort of seem natural in our environments um, that we are able to work with um, and work around and change because we are human and we have the power of creativity and ingenuity and innovation. Uh, we tend not to necessarily let the world even like strong forces within the world push us around, we can make choices um, that change how those forces affect us. Um, and I think with economics uh, and its actual divorce from sort of moral theology and more political concerns, one of, one of the failures I see in the way that we think about this is that we just assume that they're forces. Well, you know, the market says this and well, it's the market, so you can't really do anything about that. Sorry, everyone, when in fact we can. Um, to what extent we want to is the real question. Um, how much are we willing to push against or work with the invisible hand? What do we want from it enough um, to intervene? And then for your first question, I think that's a similar question to what you were asking Michael, actually. Um, you know, whether helping everyone in a sort of abstract sense is better or more important than, you know, helping individuals. And again, I think that's sort of a, a prudential question, actually, because they're not mutually exclusive, right? You can make the world wealthier. Um, you can, you know, increase health care or health outcomes for everybody. Um, while also making sure or thinking about how to lower the incidence of uh, bad outcomes for you know, individual groups. Like those are things that we can do at the same time. And I think one of our major failings um, in the way that we think about our economy and the goals that we can reach is that we think that we can't. We're capable of a lot more within our economy, uh, within our minds, within the way that we prosper than we allow ourselves to be. We can have some of our cake and eat some of it. We don't have to either keep it or <laughs> I love <laughs> cake. The whole yes. Thing. <laughs> yes. So can I? I'm gonna seem like I might be attacking Christine, which I'm not foolish enough to do. But um, so you talked about fighting against the market, and I was thinking about your blue law examples. You want to know somebody who fights against the market? Is the guy who owns Chick Fil A, right? He shuts down on Sunday. And that is a fight against the market, because I guarantee you he could sell a lot of chicken sandwiches if he was open on Sunday, and he'd make a lot more money if he did. But so we're not victims of the market. The question is, how are we as individuals going to participate in that? Are we going to 
are we going to do that? And I would just also, just on the subject of blue laws, I don't want to give an economics lecture here. The history of blue laws is mostly the history of, of uh, protectionist rules that protect retailers. Car dealers don't want to have to be open on Sunday because they don't want to have to pay the sales force. So they all get together and pass a law that says nobody can be open on Sunday. It has nothing to do with the commitment to the Sabbath and a day of rest. It's everything to do with basic sort of rent seeking on the part of government. So <laughs> that makes me sad, but apparently I'm. <laughs> but then again, I mean, your Chick-fil-A example says that that is not the case in some instances. Um, and to Chick-fil-A, I think that is actually a good example of judging what we value, uh, which is something that every human, every state, every person has to do. Uh, does the owner of Chick-fil-A value having a much more efficient workforce and working on Sundays so that he and his shareholders can make more money? Or does he value more allowing his workers and people in the community to, yes, spend time with their families and go to church? That's a choice that you have to make. Mm. That's the choice that we all make. The Roman Catholic Catechism is on your side as the Protestant, let me quote the Roman Catholic Catechism. <laughs> the Sabbath is a protest against the servitude of work. That's, I, I love that. I love that. And you think how that conflicts with 24-7. Um, uh, you know, it's just a very different way of looking at the world. So. The Sabbath is a protest against the servitude of work. All right, well, let's open it up to uh, questions from you guys. We have um, a couple, we should have a couple of microphones. Where, where, so there's one there and then one over there. So, um, yes, sir, you want to wait for a microphone if you can so that they can hear you. Uh, thank you all. I uh, have a question that I think is on the table, uh, given that a couple of the panelists mentioned uh, the fall. And I'm interested in this conversation between uh, faith and economics. Um, uh, I think it was Michael that mentioned um, that maybe we economic, economists would benefit from reading the Bible because they might learn what humans want. Um, I'm kind of curious, though, um, if you could, uh, the panelists would dive a bit deeper into that question because I, I think you run up pretty quickly into the idea that maybe what humans want is not always what they should want. Um, and so uh, I think the, um, the subject of desire gets complicated pretty quickly, and, I, and I'm curious... Um, how that conversation might look once we get that piece on the table. So, do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, no, not really, because I haven't. Because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm as usual, I'm a hypocrite. I say people should read the Bible, but I don't know the Bible very well. I had to look up that quote from Matthew. You know, I know it's kind of what it says and kind of where it was, uh, but. I think you are absolutely right that people don't know all, don't always know what they want, and what they want isn't always good for them. And this is, I think, in my mind, this is kind of circling back on this idea of, of civil society. And I don't, I'm not quite sure whether churches should or shouldn't be called civil society. I'm, I may have missed your subtlety there, but the things, you know, families and churches, and you know, the Knights of Columbus and bowling leagues and all those kinds of things, in part, their function is to control unbridled human desire. You know, I tell my kids what they want, and they better want it. Um, so. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Oh, yeah, go ahead. You're the theologian, Steve. No, you go first. No. <laughs> I'm the Anglican. <laughs> I'm a, John Wesley was an Anglican. So oh, there you go. A lot of the greats were, but I'm just saying. Um, I... Again, a good question. I think the Bible clearly shows the corruption of people, and there's no perfect system, but to me that's why I'm wary of people having more control and why, in just the most broad sense, why I find capitalism a more appealing system than socialism, because even the people who are in positions of power might not always have the best interests. And so to me, Capitalism sets the stage for as many people as possible to have as much freedom as possible to create and engage and, and what have you without those types of potentially more malevolent forces. But then, of course, this is why this is why we have regulation. It's why there should be social programs to help fill in the gaps. I mean, it's not just a laissez-faire type system. But the corruption of people is why I'm particularly wary of big government and why I support a more... Um, say, relaxed form of state control. Uh, 
Uh, I'm interested in exploring the idea of the invisible hand a little more because I think it poses certain interesting paradoxes for faith. Uh, because what it really asks us to understand is that the common good arises not out of the application of the values that faith asks us to uh, play out in our lives, but actually through the uh, playing out of selfish interests, right? So that that is kind of a paradox in itself because it sidelines the values that religion promotes. Um, on the other hand, in the pursuit of one's own special interest, one can create negative externalities that harm other people. So then it raises the question, maybe faith values should enter at the point where one can, is concerned about regulations, say, about pollution, and then that turns out to be a governmental function, but then it poses a paradox that there's always, in this country at least, a divide between church and state. So then how does one reconcile that role for faith to play if it turns out to manifest itself in the form of regulations? Thank you. The one reference to the invisible hand and the wealth of nations comes within that context of Smith arguing that the person who looks not to the, to the good of others but to his own self-interest actually serves the good better than the person who actually looks to the good. And, and, and so you, well, how can that happen? That's when he invokes the invisible hand, which is sort of a deist, stoic idea. Uh, so it's theological all the way through, and I, I still think the invisible hand is a theological idea that we have to ask if this is, if this is the character of, of the divine. But one of my concerns, and I don't know if this is, I mean, I, I assume that economists wouldn't agree with this, is that what the market rewards is greed and fear, and those are vices. And if, if that's true, if that's true, and it seems to me there's some evidence of it recently, that if that's true, then you're going to get the society you deserve. Uh, and and, and that, that's one of my major concerns is, now, now my friend uh, Deirdre McCloskey has tried to develop econom e economics based on virtue theory, um, but I, I don't think she's been successful yet. Uh, we'll see if that's true. But I would love to see an economist who actually embraces virtue theory and takes seriously the idea that a society based on what the ancients called pleonexia, Greed is a society which might have a lot of wealth, goods, wealth, what you ha what, what not, but it's also going to be a vicious society. Look, and I, I, if I'm wrong, I would love to be corrected. Uh, well, let me just push back real quickly on this greed and fear thing. Uh, what market economies reward is making other people better off uh, for whatever motivation. And mostly it's, sure, everybody is a little bit greedy. I would like a raise, and so would you. But uh, if you think about Bill Gates, he's made so many lives so much better off. The amount of money that Bill has, Mr. Gates has taken for his personal consumption is a thimbleful of the waterfall of good that he's created. And yeah, of course he likes the money, and, but he wasn't motivated primarily by greed. Again, the market rewards you for making other people better off. That's what the market does. And, and by better off, you mean? In their mind, what better off. Desire, right. So if, if I can make an operating system that makes your computer run better, and you like that, and you pay me, I've made you better off. So, so I'm just going to jump in, because that, that's kind of my question, too. I... I tend to think in sort of large questions, which irritates my editors to no end. But really the question here, and that underlines all of this is, so what is better off? And I think the one thing that we have to worry about, or at least think about, um, is whether our beliefs in the market, in these theories, um, in whatever we think is good for ourselves, which comes from who knows where, um, is in itself corrupted. Like when you, let's just take the case of uh, Steve Jobs and Apple thinking about what's better off. I mean, you really actually have to think about it. Is it better off that everybody has a smartphone? Like, does that make life better? Well, sort of. Uh, I mean, you can use a calculator anywhere. Uh, it's easy to find directions. Like all of these things are great. But then on the other hand, you have, you know, 
thousands of factory workers uh, change their desks in China. Uh, when you go out in public, like we no longer speak to each other, we're just looking at our phones. Um, there are the degradations in human and familial contact that come from uh, the excessive use of technology in our lives. But we want this because phones are fun. Maybe we have misunderstood what is better for us and what is better off in the long run. And those are the questions, the big philosophical questions that we need to think about um, when we think about what is being provided by the markets and by our desires. Just because someone has more money uh, or more goods or more technology or they can take more flights does not actually mean that they are better off as a person or that they are flourishing in a moral sense. Uh, Sorry, yeah. Uh, Of course you must know everyone that I know. (laughs) This is really terrific. It's it's excellent. Thank you all. I have three questions. I'll be very concise. Uh, what (laughs) What about the concept in the Bible in the New Testament, the law of sin in my members, the evil within the human heart? We haven't talked about that very much. Is this a first world discussion? about flourishing and what's the good life. Uh, When I did Christian ministry in Africa, talk about pregnancy discrimination, there were women, Muslim women, that would walk for three days through the bush so they could have their babies in a hospital run by the Salvation Army where there were no doctors, there were midwives. And so it's it's very different when we look at this globally than our North American affluent lifestyle. Finally, is this discussion about balance or degree, I think we'd all agree that uh, social needs production is better than military production, but would we have the society we have without a strong military? Thank you. So I'll just make a quick point uh, to, I think, your first example of whether this is a first world problem. Like, yes, this is absolutely a first world problem, whether we should have cell phones or not have cell phones. Um, but I think, though, if you, I mean, look in the Bible and look at the social teaching of really all of Christianity, there, there are things that we just sort of think of as unalloyed goods um, that, you know, people should have sort of a right to life, um, that, you know, it would be better if, you know, we didn't die in childbirth, uh, that people should have enough food. Those are really good things, and we can all agree on those. Um, it's what comes next and what we assume should come next that I think we disagree on. And I'll, I'll speak not from my own experience, actually, but both of my parents are actually from Nigeria. Um, my mom grew up like, very poor in a village uh, and moved to the United States where we have a lot more stuff. And, you know, obviously she's very grateful for this. I mean, there's a reason why she moved to the United States. Um, but she is still willing to say, you know, there are things missing here, like the community that we have in our village, um, the ability to spend time with each other uh, and not worried about whether we're going to sort of like get fired from this, that, or the other. Uh, Those were, you know, beautiful and good and virtuous things that we have in lower supply, um, sometimes in more advanced economies. And Yes, I never have a really good answer. The answer is always we have to decide, we have to balance. I would say this is not a first world problem for two reasons. One, because everything we do has an effect that we don't get to see. A few years ago, some transnational mines went to Pope Francis. and They said, we know we have a really bad reputation. Mining industry has a really bad reputation. We want to improve it. So they said, create, believe it or not, theologians who will come together, we will open everything to them, and and they can look at what we're doing, and they can then tell us what we're doing is is wrong or right. I was part of one of those at, uh, it's called the International Mineral Mining for Progress. I was part of one of those in Peru in a copper mine. And and, and this was a good mine. I mean, they cared about the environment. I mean, they leveled a mountain. I mean, the trucks that they can use. Uh, But it's still the case that none of us in here want to live on the road where those 100 trucks every day pass by houses on a 100-mile journey to get the copper so that I can have some, some... Now, I know I'm implicated in this, right? We all are. But these are the conditions for the possibility of our existence. And those, those people who mind, they want those jobs. They want them. Um, but they live in a camp. They do not have freedom. And, and they don't have democratic freedom. And Elizabeth Anderson's books on... Um, 
on why corporations um, are, are uh, basically communist governments of dictatorships, and you don't have democratic freedom. Is a very, she was here last year. It's a very telling book. So we talk about, oh, we want the corporation to be free. Corporations are mini dictatorships, most, mostly benevolent, mostly benevolent. I've worked for a few benevolent dictators, but there's no democratic processes there. So I think that's deeply problematic. My own interest in this subject matter came when I left Taylor University, which is Wheaton's poor cousin, a uh, conservative evangelical. I did go there. So no I way. Absolutely. I might know them. It's like the five people who went there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was a missionary in Honduras. I hadn't read Marx or Adam Smith. Um, but uh, every but there was a, 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 a shrimp industry on the island where I was a minister. And every night I would take the women who cut up shrimp at the factory for six, eight, ten hours a day. Only job available to them. And they appreciated it. No benefits. They went home. And I would, I would listen to their stories every night. And, and, and where, did this lo- where did this go? Red Lobster. This was a, and it, it just struck me then, this is a weird world. Their kids are dying of malnutrition, and I buried their babies. And they're creating food for people who eat, you know, as a luxury because we want to go out to Red Lobster. And, and it just, that's, that, it hit me. It just hit me that, that that's an issue that we, that we have to keep before us. What are the conditions for the possibility of our existence? Can we look at them? And can, and can we speak to them? So I'm, I'm not sure it's a first world problem. Okay, let's, let's take two more questions if we can be succinct and then I will invite everybody to continue these discussions at our reception outside where all of our panelists will be so we can continue these discussions in an informal way. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, hi, I wanted to address the comment that uh, Steve Long made about markets rewarding greed and fear. And my... My issue with that is that maybe it does, but what system doesn't? And I think that an earlier question about the Bible and what that tells us about the human condition is that people are greedy. People um, envy one another, and people do bad things to one another. And so when you think about capitalism versus socialism or communism, all I see with communism has been misery, enslavement of their own people, murdering mass amounts of people, like 100 million people in the last century. And so I would, I would argue that we have to look at the alternatives of, of capitalism. And I would argue that capitalism gives dignity to people, it allows people to do uh, to, and to flourish, and not to enslave people. So that's what I'd like to say. <laughs> Anybody want to speak yeah, I would quickly just, to just that? Just quickly, I, I do appreciate, I'm more comfortable in data myself and history, and I do think when we talk about what an ideal system looks like, we do have to look back to what the alternatives are and what history shows. And there, I, I do think it's very hard to argue that in practice, there's been a socialist country that's had more life satisfaction, more material success. You can go along a number of dimensions. That's been better. But I would also caution... Um, just since this is not only to see O'Neill Center, but also a, a conference on faith, is that no system does offer the dignity itself. That no system, even capitalism, has to be accompanied, I think, by a strong moral fabric, by humans, by... That if we're looking to that to be the savior, it's, it's not going to be, but it does set up the conditions that make it most likely for people to be given dignity and worth. And I think that's important as, to say. So, I should say, too... Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Nobody's defending Stalinism, so be careful in any kind of dogmatic argument where our options, if the options are Stalinism or capitalism, of course you're going to go with capitalism. But there's some very careful thinkers in democratic socialism today. I don't know if what they say is right about what we can do with uh, sovereign wealth funds, but I'm intrigued by it. And if I a priori I can't do it because somebody's going to sort of raise Stalinism, I can't even think about it, that seems to me to be a dogmatic argument and not a rational argument. So I- I'm not saying that they may be wrong. I mean, I, they may be wrong that the future is going to be, you know, um, we, we, we sort of slowly tax this wealth to create a corporate, um, uh, a sovereign wealth fund. I mean, I, I hope if, if, that, if, if it's going to turn into Venezuela, then of course not. But if it's going to look a little more like Norway, hey, you know, I'm not all opposed to that. So I, I just think we have to be very careful, especially in a university, to not make those kinds of uh, uh, binaries. Yeah, I think uh, I would 
definitely have to agree with that. That's actually one of the great pitfalls in opinion writing, actually. Um, these sort of, not quite a red herring, but these associations that don't necessarily have to be true. I would agree no one is saying that, you know, we should go back to communist China. Uh, that's that's just not going to happen. That's not the, the opposite of capitalism. Uh, but capitalism can be different by degree. Um, we can have capitalism that capitalism that valorizes uh, certain behaviors, that rewards uh, greed extensively, um, that rewards preying on other people's fears extensively, or some that has you know a tempering a tempering mindset where we actually think about what we really should reward uh, and perhaps yes uh, induce regulation um, that you know may not make us as profitable as we could be, perhaps, uh, but that leaves us a little bit more of our humanity. And I think that's possible. I think we can do that, and it doesn't then become the equivalent of uh, turning to full communism or full socialism. I think that's extremely possible, and that's actually what we're supposed to be working towards on this panel and in our lives. I wish we could take everybody's question, but we can only do one more uh, for this panel. Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you feel that we have become a, a society of addicted addiction to material goods? I mean, how much is enough? Is a billion dollars not enough? <laughs> and and uh, to me, there is such a void in the human heart for spirituality, uh, regardless of what that looks like. There is such a void. And we're looking for material things to fill it. And it isn't going to happen that way. So um, I really appreciate this panel. It, you all have done a fabulous job in really bringing this to, to light. Thank you. Thank you. Christine, um, you want to speak quickly to that? And yeah, I, I mean, I think I agree with you. Um, and we just haven't uh, figured out how to solve that yet. I will say that one of the things that I found very intriguing by Steve Long's first um, uh, speech was this idea that, like, perhaps in our church we should really think about how much, yeah, how much money people really should have. Um, we used to have an idea at some point that to be extremely grotesquely wealthy was, like, a little bit immoral, like maybe you should be thinking about that a little bit more. Um, one of my favorite writers, Franly Vitz, has this mostly joking line um, in which she says that, you know, you can make $50,000 by working. You can only really make $50 billion through theft. <laughs> um, and I think that there might be some truth to that. Nope. I, I will nope. say as a, as a closing word, of course, for most of us, uh, grotesque wealth is defined as about twice whatever we have. Yeah, right, right, um, right. So <laughs> that's the threshold of grotesqueness in most of our minds. Actually, um, oh, but, one more line, actually. Well, not a line, but there is research, social science research, showing that when most people achieve a certain level of wealth, um, they're happy. And the more wealthy they get, they don't actually get that much more happy. They just have more money. That should say something to us. All right. Well, let's thank our panel. I think they've really listened to us.